Um, yeah, the problem with this um, motifs that you cannot find them by sequence of structural alignments because they come from different parts of the sequence. And how we actually managed to do that, we used this new method, local special spatial pattern alignments, or just the LSD alignment. So I'm going to just give you a short description of the alignment then to show how we actually used it to um, pick up these motifs and to show you how this um, nonlinear motifs organize the whole uh, protein panel structure and give you an example that was published recently. So uh, it's a graph theory method, uh, based method that um, not to introduce any kind of special mathemat mathematical language. I'll just try to explain you how it actually uh, works just in physical objects sense. So the protein molecule we consider is as a set of vectors. So every residue is a vector that uh, usually is between self C alpha and C beta, but it's optional. And we, of course, we consider what kind of residue it is. So what we do in the first uh, step, we derive all the pairs of vectors uh, in, in the molecule within a particular range. We don't want to uh, consider residues that are sitting on like, different parts of the molecule. So in some kind of reasonable vicinity about 10, 15 exchange. So, after, uh, so each pair is described by four distances uh, between the C alpha and C beta, and one um, actually three distances, and one dihedral angle between them. So we, when we want to compare two proteins, we derive this kind of pairs from one, from the other protein, then we just compare them. So if they, these pairs, this, this pair and this one, are made by similar residues, and we have a criteria for that to decide if they're similar or not. And they, they are having the same kind of distances and the angle. So we think that they're similar pairs. So we derive all the similar pairs from, from this set. And then using uh, graph theory methods that are classical and pretty effective, we, we find if these pairs have connectivity in, in both proteins. So as a result, we have um, like similarity map that shows what residues in protein 1 are positioned in the same way like pro these residues in protein 2. This is an example of comparison of two protein kinases, a PKA and CDK2. Uh, so they, this, this, this kind of uh, maps of similarity. And the, the most important feature of the method was that we didn't realize it in the very beginning but it's not only giving you the list of the residues that are similar to these proteins, but uh, it gives you the rank of, of these residues. The number of connections of, uh, for, for any particular residue uh, is a very valuable information. Uh, because when we started to look at this maps, we saw that the most important residues, like catalytically important, uh, active, Highly conserved residues sit in the middle of this map and have multiple connections. And it makes sense because if, if, if the residue is very important, it's surrounded by um, partners or supporting actors that are providing the positioning of, of this particular residue. So, what we started to look at, uh, we, we started to count the number of these uh, connections on, on the similarity map and introduce it introduced the idea of so-called involvement score. That the, what we show that uh, highly important residues have very high important involvement scores. So just to make uh, sure that these lines on, on the maps, they don't introduce the distance relations because it's 2D thing. So just to give you an example of how this kind of uh, simulatory maps would look like in 3D, this is a comparison of PKA to amino glucoside. Uh, phosphotransferase. So um, uh, they're very distant, distant related molecules, and you see that uh, the method was capable to pick up the uh, catalytically important uh, core. So what 
how everything started is, is you remember Susan was introducing the problem yesterday about protein kinases, and she showed a picture how dis different are the surfaces of different kinases. So we wanted to compare surfaces of kinases, and especially we was going to see what is conserved <coughs> and what is different in active uh, kinases versus inactive kinases, and maybe to pick up the, the mechanism that is common for activation in, in different kinases. So we looked at the surface residues. Um, we, we took P active PKA, compared it to three active and three inactive kinases, and uh, put the involvement scores in active-active comparison here as white bars, and when we compare active to inactive as black bars. So the biggest difference between white and black, the more this residue is changing upon activation or inactivation. So uh, the result was pretty pr predictable. So we see that the agility from, from uh, activation loop was very sensitive to activation. Uh, a little bit this catalytic loop and C helix, of course. Uh, what was uh, unexpected, we found, for example, this is slicing 7 to 2 that we were talking about. See, that's like the one of the highest scores. Uh, this one is slicing from the FG motif. Uh, they, they have very uh, high involvement scores. But on the third place, we had lysine 106. And it was very um, kind of unusual, and nobody heard about this lysine 106. Uh, what, what was the, the function of this lucid? So when we started to look around, we saw that it's contacting another leucine 95 from the sea hills. They're just sitting very close to each other. And uh, this leucine was in contact with phenylalanine from the OG monster. So we had like a stack of three hydrophobic residues that were aligned in the active structure. So, um, and we know because the, the tires and from HRD material didn't show up here because it was not surface exposed because we looked on only on the surface. So we, we, we found that this combination, these four hydrophobic residues, the sitting next to each other in all active kinases, is a conserved feature. And um, it was, I have to say, it was very <laughs> exciting. And we turned it spine because at first it looked like spine well, when you draw the, the kind of surface around it. So, so the idea was when they, uh, the uh, kinase is active, it's uh, assembled, and these residues, the blue ones, represent the, um, the uh, axis of rotation during the breathing motion that was calculated in, in, in Andy McCann's group. And it was pretty much like perpendicular to it. So in, in, in it was an idea that we have this like hydrophobic spine that holds these two residues together and let it move. And that was, uh, it led to this activation mechanism. So we have, in, uh, when we have active kinase, this spine is formed by four different parts from, from four different elements from, from the kinase. It holds the M lobe and C lobe together. And because it's hydrophobic, it's pretty flexible. So it can provide this closing and opening a pretty wide range. So you, you can get ATP in and ADP out and all kinds of things. But when you break the spine, when C helix is out and the salt bridge is broken, it breaks the spine as well. So M lobe doesn't know where the C lobe is, so the ATP cannot be positioned on, in, in the right spot, the spot anymore. So. Uh, so it's, uh, we call it now a regulatory spine because it regulates the activity of the kinases. And this is just an example of numbering. You can see that numbers of the sequence of this uh, residues that's active and inactive start come from, from, from different places. So how we can define these structural motifs in general? Um, the problem is that the traditional approach is not relevant because we uh, what, what is a motif? Motif is when we have a DFG, APE that 
sits next to each other in the sequence. But when you have residues like that, that coming from different parts of the sequence, it, it's not working. So we, we were thinking, like, we, we have to address it from some kind of meaningful reason, from the point of functionality. So we were thinking, OK, how the core is assembled in, in protein kinase? So we have to have a structure that positions ATP. Then we have to have a structure that positions substrate. And then we have to put these um, parts together close to each other in a very precise and very robust way. So we have to have some kind of a beginning of a system of coordinates, the basis where we can build the house around. So we uh, now we look at the whole core uh, of a protein kinase. So the approach was pretty much the same. We took uh, all active forms, uh, PKA, uh, compared to uh, four different families, including tyrosine kinase, the blue base, and put their scores over here. So you see that if, if you have all the colors present here, it means that this uh, residue has very high score in, in all the comparisons. So it was striking that F helix turned out to be like a number one. Uh, only uh, uh, activation loop can kind of com compete with it in terms of the scores. And the F helix is pretty interesting. Helix is sitting in the middle of the hydrophobic core of this silo. So we were thinking, can F helix be an organizing hub for, for this, all the structures? This, this is the basis, the basement for, for the house. And uh, the good news was that uh, the, there is a G220 that is uh, conserved in all the kinases, and it binds the, the basis of the regulatory supply. So uh, then we started to look like an individual uh, uh, acids, I mean the acids in there. And so the, the beginning was this 220, that's a high score over here. And the, f the last one was 231. So 231 was another un unknown residue. I mean, 230 was pretty well known. It's, it's a highly conserved residue. Uh, it's, um, it, it binds the substrate arginines usually, so it's involved in all these very important things. But methionine 231 was absolutely unknown. So, so we started to look around in the same way how we did this with regulatory spine. And we found that there is another methionine 128 that also was highly scored. And the three hydrophobic residues that uh, made the beta cell of <laughs> uh, And it goes up to the adenine ring of ATP. So we, we see that uh, together with, with this loosening over here, we see how this, uh, this construction of this nonlinear uh, motif comes from the F helix right to the ATP and um, very high conserved and highly scored residues are on the top covering the, the engineering ring. So we have another spine that comes from the F helix up to the beta strands and it's the, the, the beauty of the structure is it's uh, completed with ATP. So when you have ATP in a solution it comes in and clo closes the whole molecule. So yes, we, we tried to look around all, all the uh, kinases, the eukaryotic kinases, of course, when, because if you don't have a helix, again, it's not organized. So it's it's pretty highly conserved, very very precise um, alignments, and uh, so so we have these two regulatory spines that come from two parts of of the F helix, and in the, by the way, the needle between them sits the, the gatekeeper. So, they, uh, so we have ATP positioned, and the, the, other, uh, the other feature was that the, the catalytic loop was bound very precisely to the F helix as well, providing the orientation of, of these three actually uh, uh, completely important residues, so we see how it's everything organized very, very simple and very precise. Um, the uh, the substrate binding is also organized around the helix, so this is the U motif that comes up to the P plus one loop, and this is the E two thirty that binds to the arginines, at least in PKA um, uh, 
stuff. So finally, what we have, we have uh, an organization of kinase core rounding up helix through these two spines. One spine is completed when we have a C helix in, and the other is completed when the ATP is in. So we have uh, ATP uh, bound in a precise way, the substrate bound in a precise way, all the catalytically important residues are in place. And uh, the, the whole structure becomes kind of more simple. It makes sense when, when you have, uh, like for example, little, little D here was sitting on, on the side of this molecule. I was always wondering why this D here is there. But uh, it, according to the small words, it's just the part of the C spine. Um, so, what I was going to show you was a recent publication made uh, in, in the uh, George Daly lab together with uh, John Kurian's lab. Uh, they were studying the uh, oncogenic mutants of able kinase. The, the gatekeeper residue that is in evil usually is stream, uh, when mutated in, in, onto isoleucin, it becomes constitutively active and resistant to Gleevec. So what, uh, what they try to do, they try to mutate uh, the, this is the spine, and this is the uh, isoleucine. You see the isoleucine is much bigger than 3 in, so it kind of locks the spine in the active conformation. So uh, this is, uh, this is a, uh, the, the phosphorylation thing. So when, when you have the, uh, the mutant, so this is the mutant, it's phosphorylating, when you mutate the, the top of the spine, it's still phosphorylating, but this is the less extent, and the rest, uh, the, this residue, oops, okay, I was supposed to have a, a couple of uh, errors in here too. So when you mutate the other residues from the spine, the phosphorylation is gone. And the other thing is that they, they tried um, this compound 14 that is having three fluorines sitting right in the middle of regulatory spine. And they show that it can overcome the resistance uh, that Gleevec has in, in this uh, mutant. So the conclusion of the paper was very um, interesting for us because it was encouraging uh, that they say that uh, <coughs> the hydrophobic spine serves a structural element and the future drug design uh, has to address this kind of structures. So finally, I'd just like to say that there is a visualization system uh, written by Sancho Busco. We were trying to find some funding for this thing, but we turned us down, but so he wrote it anyway. Uh, but uh, now he's uh, in LA, and unfortunately we don't have any help in there. But if anybody will want to use it, you're welcome to uh, send me a message. I'd be happy to, to assist. And I would like to thank Susan Taylor and Lynn tonight for support of this work. Thank you for the much.
the results can be very uh, interesting. You can find some residues that are sitting somewhere, you know, on the sign that they don't look terribly important, especially hydrophobic residues. And you see how hydrophobic residues can be, you know, very influential, especially in terms of the signaling or assembling of, of uh, molecules. So it could be very important. And we, we are trying to uh, look at the different families right now. Yes. Um, so, if you look at inactive kinases, do you see any difference? Uh, that's that was an interesting thing. But we know that inactive kinases are inactivated in so many different ways that could be an interesting project. Mm -hmm. So, if somebody would kind of you know found the time and the money or students or something, you know, to do that, we could figure out. So I definitely could classify different uh, inactive structures and find similarities and maybe an interesting uh, mechanisms how they get inactivated. That's for sure. I guess maybe an interesting way to do that would be to look at what's conserved. See if there's some core that's conserved between the inactive and the active, and then what's the variability? What regions are the variable regions? Yeah, but get an idea of how is it always the same regions that are in, in some sense that's what we have here on this uh, on this thing. Okay. This uh, when we have high black yeah. uh, uh, bars, it means that uh, they are of, uh, similar in active and, and inactive. inactive. Yeah. Okay, so then so there's some regions that are really just. Yeah, like there, right? like like C, the cis prime will be yeah. of course there yeah. as soon as we have it. Okay. Because it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Carol, so, so could you go back to analytics on and see if there was a function? I think I'd better show you this this picture. So, see, um, <coughs> we have here two thirty. And here we have uh, 222, and if you want to build uh, a platform for the substrate binding. So, so they uh, they providing the substrate that lies over here. So the C yeah, this is uphill. So the C point together with R point, uh, or C point major function is to position ATP in a very very precise way. And if you look, if you align here uh, different kinases on just F helix not paying attention to anything else, just have kills. You will find that ATP uh, adding ring is positioned in a very precise way, actually. So, so, so the, 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 the phosphate. No, the, the adding ring, yeah. So, so you have to, to take care of the gum phosphate and the glycine release will be doing that, et cetera, et cetera. So, so the major function is to provide uh, the positioning of ATP knowing where the the substrate is because a substrate bound bound to the aculus as well. So we have like center of coordinates that, that provides this position of ATP and substrate. And of course, the second uh, kind of function is to um, you know carry all this, uh, pr provide the position of this uh, very important residue. So that's. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's much. The top is cut off. Yeah, it's 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 much bigger. The hydrophobic. I, I mean, here's you have the the gatekeeper, for example. <coughs> then you have here uh, different uh, residues, but they are not that conserved like these two. This is pretty much always alanine. Alanine is seventeen pK. Maria, maybe I have a really question for you, but I think so your hydrophobic spine, because in the catalytic side, catalytic end that you're showing, is really connected to what uh, John Lewis was showing in his sort of uh, allostery, or all these early simulations that we really see the you know, movement, they have to be connected. Somewhere there has to be some con you know, constructed thing, and they cannot be anything. So has there any effort to look into that, how that spine formation, it's not going to look into the formation, uh, 
how uh, because you're all working on the one and so many work on this PKA, so this is very really easy to do, but I guess it will be easy to do that. How do you I just wanted to emphasize one thing that, that it's very important that this point is 100 I understand. Because they, they in are. In the context of the kind yeah. of these activity, that has to be, they are not separate. They cannot be separate. Even also, that's also, that's also well but I think uh, we're but both. You can do the, the NMR with, uh, with the label in the hydrophobic yeah. side chain. That's, yeah, that's, that's, that's the thing that you can really do. Talking about this flexibility yeah. of this, and yeah, the you are not flexible in your deck. It's beautiful yeah. in terms of allowing this internal motion. But, but, but your point is well taken. There's a very interesting thing that affects all the signaling proteins that we're sort of, we're all flirting with it, but we haven't explained in a nice way. In some points you can do like a local perturbation and you have a global motion. At other points you can have a global motion that affects a local perturbation further from where you are. So all these things we are sort of getting there and how these things get related, I don't think it's only the kinase or this particular case, but the question is how do you have a local perturbation affect a global motion that affect a local signal that goes there, and how do we bring all that together? Well, I think um, with that, I'd like to thank everybody for their attention for a very exciting morning session where we went from in vivo into in vitro into in silico with some beautiful fluorescence studies and a whole lot of different techniques that we can use to, to really understand these important plaque class and molecules.